The Quad City Symphony has a great Mahler tradition. And James Dixon, one of my predecessors, who of course conducted the orchestra, I think, for longer than any other music director, uh, felt very close to the music of Mahler. And one thing that actually surprised me very much was that this symphony was never performed, has never been performed by the Quad City Symphony. I thought with James Dixon, a great Mahlerian who introduced many, many symphonies to the Quad City audiences, that this would would have, have a history, you know, at least one performance. But for whatever reason, James Dixon never performed this piece with the Quad City Symphony. And when I saw that, and when I knew how much I loved this piece, and with the experiences that I've had with it in the recent past, it was something that I really wanted to present to our audience. It took so long for his work to come into the mainstream that music, the history of music, had moved on to other things, as it were, right? I mean, really, uh, it's the generation, well, Bruno Walter starts it, but Leonard Bernstein, so we're talking about the, the 50s and then the 60s as audiences, bigger, you know, national, inter international audiences, I should say, really start to listen to this music, and he starts to become a staple of the repertory. Uh, I remember having a wonderful conversation with one of my teachers. Uh, he's passed away now. His name was Martin Picker. Martin was a uh, specialist in medieval music, but uh, he had a very wide range in, in, you know, of interests in music. And we were talking about Richard Strauss and, um, and Mahler. Uh, I think Martin was contrasting the Alsosprach with the Das Lied von der Erde. Uh, and he said when he studied these pieces, sort of side by side, as a student in college in the 1940s, it was clear to everyone, scholars, students, everyone, that Strauss was the, the great genius composer and Mahler was also kind of interesting over here on the side. And by the time I was studying with Martin Picker in the mid-1970s, the balances on the scales had shifted, just shifted totally the other way, so that now you'd have very few people, I mean, there must be some, that who would say, no, also Bach is a great piece and thus leave from there. You know, no, it's the opposite, it's totally the opposite. So it took, I mean, and now, so we're talking about, he died in 1911, we're talking about, you know, a lot of years later, that 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 shifting perspective on on his music uh, happened. The first step when you decide to perform a piece like this is making sure that it that it fits as part of a coherent as as an important part of a coherent season. I mean, you wouldn't want five concerts with Mahler symphonies on it. So once it's planned, then we talk. We figure out how the chorus is going to work, we figure out the rehearsal schedule, the soloist, the mezzo-soprano soloist. Then it's a matter of preparing, preparing the parts. You know, it's, it's a very complicated for every member of the orchestra. It's a virtuosic piece. You know, there's a trombone, a fantastic trombone solo in the first movement, the first trombone. In usual orchestral things, doesn't, isn't a big soloist. You know, it's kind of rare to have such a, a hugely important part. And so, Trombonist, the, the, the trumpet player has a big offstage thing. I mean, it, Mahler gives tremendous challenges for every single member of the orchestra. And already, even months ahead, you know, you hear people practicing the excerpts, and you know people are, people in the orchestra, musicians, are primed for this because it's a big deal. It's a really big deal. It's a big deal for our audience, it's a big deal for the musicians. In terms of uh, preparation for a thing like this, uh, I think. With Mahler especially, what we find is that he can be so detail-oriented and he asks for so much of everyone, I think, and you, playing the first violin part, often, you know, really difficult string parts, and you can go half a bar and have him tell you one thing and then reverse it in the other half bar, and uh, I mean, it, it, we kind of joke about it as musicians because Sometimes he'll write, you know, imperceptibly softer or almost inaudible. He asks for um, such a range that that really pushes us, but is never too much. Uh, in Austria, they were probably using rotary valve trumpets, and uh, in America, they were using piston 
valve trumpets. The valve itself doesn't make a lot of difference in the sound, but the nature of the instrument uh, that, that go with those two different configurations sounds much different. The piston trumpets tend to be brighter and uh, will project through the orchestra more. The rotary valve trumpets tend to blend more with the orchestra, and that's been the tradition in uh, Germany, German orchestras, German-influenced orchestras. And now in America, a lot of orchestras, we do use rotary valve trumpets for a certain part of the repertoire. My approach to it has been to use rotary trumpets uh, for most symphonies that would have been written before the trumpet had valves because it, it gives you a little bit more of that natural trumpet sound, but certainly not an authentic natural trumpet sound, but a more blending one and a less piercing one. For the Mahler, which I'm really excited about playing, I've, I've played most of the Mahler symphonies, um, but not the third, and the third has got that big beautiful post horn in the third movement, and I've always wanted to play that and never had the opportunity, so I was pretty excited when I saw the rep list come out last spring that uh, I might finally have a, a chance to have a go at it. Um, that's a puzzle as far as what they use on it. Uh, the first editions of the symphony called for post horn, and it's always been referred to as a post horn solo. But uh, in some of the editions that came out later, uh, Mahler himself, I understand, changed that to flugelhorn. He'd heard a military band flugelhorn and decided that that was what he was looking for. That was the proper instrument. Um, I've heard of a few people that have tried playing it on flugelhorn, and I've indeed tried it myself in my practice, but I don't have any flugelhorns that I would trust getting through the thing in tune with anyway. So uh, uh, the tradition as I've known it from the time I was a student is to, to use a large bore, higher pitched instrument. I think the reason that he uh, is so detailed and careful with his his instructions has to do with the fact that he was uh, in an administrative position as well as being a master conductor, a really famous person in his time. Um, he was the general director of the Vienna Opera as well as being the chief conductor and so I think he he wrote all of these instructions in order to make rehearsal time is more efficient, you know, he, he knows what the musicians need to see um, and, you, and so you don't waste time, you know, making all these small adjustments, we can, we can come prepare with that. Um, and the other part of, of bringing the work from, you know, just your own part to, to the stage is uh, the fact that there are so many musicians on stage and it's such a grand piece and a moving journey and um, Usually you work on your parts and it might be simple, it might be complicated, but um, the, the scale is not so vast. You're going to be one of maybe 60 or 70 people on stage. Uh, but when you work on a Mahler symphony, you know, you're going to be joined by over 100 people on stage. Um, some of them will be vocal soloists and choir, you know, children's choir, adult choir. Um, each having worked on their parts separately, and uh, the energy of all that coming together can be really incredible. The other part that's unique to this particular um, project that we're doing is, is that we're using five different choirs, and we haven't ever been together up to this point. And we have, there's a couple more weeks before um, we put it all together, but tonight will be the first night when everybody will be in the same room together. So everyone's been practicing on their own. We've got, we've got the Oratorio Society, which is um, members of the community. We've got um, the Quad City Choral Arts, which is also a community group that is auditioned. We have members of the Augustana Choir, some of the women from the Augustana Choir. We've got members from Jenny Lind Vocal Ensemble which is a group conducted by Michael Zemek, um, a colleague of mine here at Augustana. And actually, that's probably the largest group of all. And so they've been working on their own during their re regular rehearsals. 
and then the Pleasant Valley High School um, Chamber Choir that Meg Byrne, do, Meg Byrne does from um, Pleasant Valley High School. They, they've been practicing on their own, and I will be going to them this week also to work after we have our rehearsal this evening. And then all of those groups, in addition to the youth choir, the Quad City Youth Choir Chorus, so, we, so all of those groups are going to come together for the first time tonight. When I talked to Mark about this project, in the fir he wanted to include the community. In fact, that's what he always wants to do. He's, he, he's very interested in making sure that a lot of people are included. And originally, it was my thought that because we were using women, that we might not have enough people in our choir. And so I went to these other choir directors and I said, would you be interested? We'd like to have you involved. We'd like to have you involved. And I, actually, I think the age spread of this particular group is really fantastic because we've got the we got the children's choir um, or youth choir and then we have a high school group and there are some of the youth choir that are of that age too there's some younger and some that are of that age and then we have a high school group and then we have a collegiate group and we have um, the community both community groups which span a quite a wide range of ages from there are some collegiate age all the way up to people who are in you know who are retired people that are in their 60s and and so it's it's from the youngest to the oldest and um, so as it's turned out we have plenty of singers the kids that are in the youth choir just have no idea what the end is going to look like so this journey started with a lot of unknowns in fact the whole youth choir journey that we began this year started with the notion that we would need kids for this production and who better than our own homegrown talent to to do that so this whole year we have told them and told them and told them how important this Mahler production would be and it's really hard for a, for a child from the ages of 8 to roughly 15 or 16 to imagine that five minutes of anything in the big scheme of a 95 minute extravaganza is in any way important. So what I've tried to do is explain to them how important they really are to this and when Mark Russell Smith came and worked with us a few weeks ago it was wonderful to watch how he fashioned that for them too. And he was explaining about his own personal experience singing this when he was about 15 years old and what it was like to sit there in this immense group of, of musicians and be a part of something so huge. Unlike you might su uh, suspect, the students aren't intimidated by what's going on. The, the youth are not intimidated by the older singers. I think they sort of feel like, oh, we're singing with older people. This is really a cool experience. And so somehow there, there's a sense that, that this is a special, it makes it a special event for everyone involved. And the older singers really like the opportunity to work with the younger singers because they in, in a way, they, I think they feel a little bit like they can be teachers, but I think in, in another way, they realize how quickly this, the youth learn and how, you know, how really fine singers they are at their age. And I think they sometimes feel like, wow, that's amazing what they can do at that age. So it's really a cool thing in both directions. Um, so the really, really fun part and the really interesting thing is to imagine each of those constituencies preparing the choir all together with the children's chorus, the women's chorus, the very large orchestral forces, the alto soloist, the conductor, and everyone beginning to understand both in the micro what their part is and starting to even imagine what that's going to be. Maybe even more than feel like or sound like, but what it actually becomes. And this is the magic, and this is the magical thing. We get a sense of it in a dress rehearsal. And one might think, well, a dress rehearsal, that's just like a performance. 
And in many ways, a dress rehearsal is just like a performance. We come out, we, we rehearse our bows, we're not going to be dressed like we will for a performance, but we're going to go from beginning to end. There may be some notes afterwards, but it's like a performance. But it's still not the magic, because what matters above all is people in the house, all those hearts and minds, and everybody on stage, in some way, and in whatever way they want to conceive of it, in some way, we're doing something somewhat sacred. Um, so it's, um, that's the magic, is that, that completely unique moment. In this case, we're talking about a moment of 90 minutes, but in the scheme of things, it's still a moment, and it's very, very unique to be a part of that, no matter where you are in that group. It's really a matter of, of allowing yourself to be taken into that world and to take a journey. It's, it's a journey that's slower paced than, you know, than what we see on television or the really fast ads. I mean, it's just a very different world, but it's such a rich, expressive world that, that I, I think this is why conductors like James Dixon were attracted to the music and, and were, like I, passionate about bringing it to audiences. And so, when I saw that this would be the Quad City Symphony premiere, and it's a piece that I love, I thought it was the perfect way to conclude our 99th season. Because it is about the tradition that we have, the tradition of Mahler performances. And it's a tremendous challenge for the orchestra, but a challenge that they love. I mean, to, to, to work with a masterwork like this and to bring it to life, it takes a lot of work. And it takes a lot of individual practice, and it takes working together. But when you create something as expressive and as gorgeous as the last movement of this third symphony. It, it takes you to places that no, nothing else can. And so it's fantastic for the audience, it's fantastic for the players, and it's part of our great legacy that we have here at the Quad City Symphony. Yeah.